You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Eight days. Eight days is all I have left until we are out of school and I can stop waking up at 5 a.m. for at least, you know, three months or so. <laughs> and I'm super excited about that. Well, anything before 6 a.m. is obscene. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I can get up and do it. But now that I no longer have to, because I did that for almost five years with seminary because mm-hmm. an hour and a half drive in and yeah. If I never have to go back to the 5 a.m. wake up, I will be thrilled. Yeah, I, it's uh, by the time this airs, these, those eight days will be gone. But man, I am super excited. It's like I can see the end. Um, and, you know, because I have to get there and make sure everything's ready before everyone else gets there. And but having that end in sight is like the worst so, possible. It, it's like limbo. No, it's it's not. It's like it's exciting to me. I'm like I'm, I'm almost there. And and this has been a pretty good school year. Oh no, I I I hate that. If I just know I've got to keep my head down, and keep moving, I can do it. But the minute the end is in sight, it's like I can't make it. I can't. I I just can't. So um, yeah, I I'm like that with some things, but not this because I think I'm just used to it. It's that's been the cycle of my life. Or, I mean, I, even though even, even though I haven't worked at the school except the last three years, but it's just been kind of, you know, being married to a teacher, you get used to that cycle and you're like, okay, well, this is it. We're almost there. And you, <laughs> you start to get excited about it. So, um, Well, but, the end of the school years were always mixed bag for me with teaching because that's when everything ramps up mm-hmm. right before the big letdown. So Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, we, we've been busy. We have been super busy. Oh, I know. You guys have, yeah. your schedules have been wild. Well, everybody's schedules have been wild. Yeah. But... And, and the fact that we're at a private school, I think that gives us a couple more programs that we wouldn't have if we were in the public school. But I'm y'all totally do, okay with that. Yeah. Y'all do crazy things at the school that we never would have done. And yeah, but I mean, we, we were homeschooled. So, you know, that's a whole other topic right there we did all kinds of things at at our school (laughs) technically and mom said they were schooling and teaching us things but i think it was just child labor so (laughs) probably so anyway uh, speaking of child labor sure let's go there i don't know (laughs) although joseph isn't really a child he's not a child anymore (laughs) he's an adult he's married he has kids uh so we left off last week um Judah had just given his big speech to to Joseph and explained that they couldn't bring Benjamin or that Benjamin needed to be safe because he was so bound up with Jacob. And there was some ambiguity of who was really reliant on who. But the real thing in that text that was so important was the fact that Judah acknowledged that Jacob has his favorites. Mm-hmm. And there was no animosity with Judah. There was no bitterness over it. It was just, this is the way it is. This is what we have to live with. And we still need to love our brothers in spite of this favoritism. And that's really where we left off. So now we're moving into Joseph's response to Judah. Okay. And it doesn't seem like, so we're, we're in chapter 45. Mm-hmm. And in the first verse, it says Joseph could, could no longer control himself before all his attendants. So you kind of get this feeling that maybe Joseph wasn't even ready to out himself yet. But seeing that Judah's heart had changed and knowing that Reuben had at least tried to do something to save him and that it wasn't all the brothers who completely hated him that and that his dad's still alive, that Joseph kind of just breaks. Mm-hmm. And he is... You, you kind of wonder why why was he holding out why was he kind of hesitant to make this revelation? And was he just hesitant in front of the Egyptian leaders or the attendants? Or was it he didn't want to add himself to his brothers? Yeah. Well, I, I think there was definitely that, that part of, you know, beforehand he was just wanting to, to mess with them and see how things were going and kind of had that like, oh, yeah, you're going to pack me up and send me off? Well, look where I am now kind of, kind of attitude. Oh, and I think we see that in the speech because Joseph's getting ready to go into this this huge speech and it's 
one of the longer speech speeches in the Torah. Mm-hmm. Uh, really about the only person who speaks more than Joseph in the Old Testament, all put together, other than the prophets, uh, is Solomon. Okay. So when you're getting to the narrative, Solomon and Joseph kind of have the most words. Um, there's also kind of the wondering, you know, is he doing all of this, getting Benjamin there? Was he trying to save Benjamin? Was there a bit of um, suspicion on his part that maybe Benjamin was in trouble? Right. No, that's an interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that, but... Well, I hadn't I, either. <laughs> I can see that. Um, yeah, like, well, they they sold me. Maybe I should. Maybe we should get the other one out. <laughs> right. Well, and I and you know, obviously, I stole that straight from some of the sages' writings and mm-hmm. and some of the rabbinic text around this passage. Because, and I, I was actually having a conversation this morning with a friend of mine who we're going to have on the show later. Um, she uh, and I were talking about this that you know those rabbinic texts can really open up some ideas. But as we've t- spoken in the past, you know, finding that balance. So. I think that's a good question that they bring in this instance. It, it could have been Joseph trying to protect Benjamin because he mm-hmm. does have a protective streak. Right. And I mean, obviously he's going to save the whole world. And <laughs> this is, uh, you know, that's his words. Um, matter of fact, that's in his speech. He says uh, it's two, it's now two years and there's been a famine in the land. There's going to be five more. And he says, God sent me ahead of you to ensure your survival on earth and save the lives in and ensure survival on earth, save your lives in extraordinary deliverance. Um, you did not send me here, but God, and he has made me father to Pharaoh. Now, this is important. Joseph is saying, you've made me father to Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. And we discussed that some when we were discussing Joseph's wife and all the gifts that Pharaoh gave him, giving him a name, that Pharaoh really was acting as the father to right. Joseph. Uh, but that kind of gives you some insight into where Joseph's head is at. Yeah, he's as far as he knows, he's in charge of everything. Yeah, and he still he still has that look at me, I'm so great attitude. Well, I mean, uh, can you really blame him? I mean, you're he's put in a society where he's been given this uh, position of status. Pharaoh himself says the spirit of God is in him. Right. I I mean, in in the Egyptian culture, like we talked about before, you know, saying that you have the spirit of a god in you means that you're that god's representation on earth. And so, you know, he's being told, basically, he has a godlike position. That's going to give anyone a, a little bit of a big head. Well, and you hit it right on the head. But I didn't mean to, like, go there. But anyway, uh, no, because when he's saying he's father of Pharaoh, who is the father of Pharaoh? It's Ra. It's, yeah, Ra or Horus or whoever. whoever <laughs> yeah. yeah. Depending on what time it is. <laughs> so, yeah. So Joseph is basically saying, I am like a god. I don't know if that's necessarily what he's intentionally saying, Mm -hmm. but it's got that connotation. And, you know, when he talks to his brothers, he's like, "Uh, come down to me without delay. Yeah. Uh, And then he says, uh, I will provide for you. Um, He uses the word Moshe, uh, which is the same word that when he had the dreams Mm -hmm. and he says, I'm going to rule over you. That's what that means is to rule. So he speaks. Uses that specific word, so you kind of wonder: Is he needling the brothers? And hey, I I made it. Well, and I I think there is an aspect of that going on to where he before he reveals himself to his brothers, he wants them to see he, he wants them to perce- to perceive him as being in in full glory. Oh, absolutely. And so, you know, it is one of those things where it is. I, I think he's. I mean, he's he's trying to stick it to him and just be like, hey, we're you know. He is so human. I mean, he, he oh, really yeah. is. And he, cause yeah, the full glory as far as, okay, here's my power and authority in Egypt. I'm a Nakash. I'm a diviner. I can figure all these things out. Yeah. It, it, it basically, it's a, it's a, it's a political prank in, in all, in all reality. <laughs> it really, and it is. And, and this become, has, this whole story has so many political ramifications. And, but if you read through his, his speech, You'll see this change in language. You know, when, when Pharaoh sent for him, he says, God's going to take care of you, not me. Sure. And, you know, the correct political language here, let me be humble. Mm-hmm. And then with his brothers, he is, um, he tells them, and you must tell my father everything about my high station in Egypt and all that you have seen and bring my father here with all speed. You know, go home and brag to dad about yeah. what I've done. Yeah. Now it's, it, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's funny. Now, 
Um, before we get to that part of it, because um, one of the things that that is in the the text is that um, he tells the servants to go. Mm-hmm. Like, so it's just him and his brothers. Right. And I, I have heard it speculated that the reason for that is that when he's going to reveal himself as Joseph, that, you know, he probably looks different enough and that maybe the brothers might recognize him, but that he was actually going to show that he had been circumcised. And so that's why he sent everyone out. I don't know how much I buy that, given modesty being a different deal during the time. Um, of course, you also, we talked about this off mic some. You mentioned that Egyptians were circumcised mm-hmm. as well, but it was also a different method. Yeah. So, um, it, um, and again, you know, I don't know how much of the details we want to get in that, but I, I, I thought that <laughs> speculation was funny. It's like, no, I, I've got the proof, uh, you know. Right. Well, and, and this was part of the proof of being Jewish, and we actually see that... Um, Coming into play later on, um, the Jews who wanted to identify with the Greeks mm-hmm. and the Romans uh, who had not been circumcised had developed a way to undo their circumcision. And I don't even want the details on that. Yeah, I, well, it's been preserved in historical writings, should you care, at some point. But, uh, I'll pass. <laughs> but it, it was something that they knew that, you know, because Greeks did all of their sports in the nude. And uh, this is, a you know, just part of their culture. They would be immediately identified as Jewish because of the circumcision. Sure. So th- this was historically a problem. And now whether this comes into play with Joseph or not, I, I don't know. Uh, because also we're going to get ready to go into uh, when Joseph talks to his brothers about going before Pharaoh mm-hmm. and discussing the fact that shepherds are abhorrent sure. to, to the Egyptians. So did he want to be identified as a Jew and possibly lose his status before Pharaoh? How much did Pharaoh know about his background? We really don't know. Right. Well, uh, apparently something, because uh, doesn't Potiphar's wife even say, you brought this Hebrew in to to mock me? mm -hmm, She does. And the question is, how much of that made it to Pharaoh? Right. And that's that's the problem, because Pharaoh didn't have the book. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, but I'm guessing there had to be, I don't know, there, there had to be some of that information. They, but they knew that I'm he guessing. was definitely Semitic. Sure. And that we're going to talk about why that can be just being from Canaan in general. It didn't matter, you know, if you were Hebrew or not, um, why that's going to be a problem. We're going to get into that in just a minute. Um, but there, the display of emotion that he was getting going through that he mm-hmm. couldn't hold back definitely would have been shameful for somebody in a leadership position. Sure. Sure. So, and when you first started to talk, I thought maybe you were going here. If the brothers didn't believe him, how would that hurt his credibility in front of the attendants? Right. And so, you know, maintaining that image, I mean, Joseph seems to be very image conscious. I mean, go yeah, home yeah. and tell my father everything. <laughs> um, but you know, he, his his language changes as he's talking to them versus when he was talking to Pharaoh. Very much the difference from talking to a superior to an inferior or a peer. A subordinate. Yeah. And he um he he never makes an apology for any of the stuff. Right. You know, Judah expresses regret and remorse over what they've done. And he he realizes they've been caught and he knows that they're being caught not for actually having done anything wrong to Joseph, the Egyptian ruler. But he feels like they've been caught for what they've done to Joseph, and God has kind of brought it back around as retribution. Right. And so Judah owns it. Joseph never owns that he played any part in this. And I think that's significant that that it's it's Judah. I and mean, we talked about how Judah really is the hero of the story. Um, right. And and the and that would actually, I mean, if you're if you're comparing and contrasting Joseph and Judah, I know we'll probably get into this a little bit later. Um, Maybe not this show. I don't know how far we're going to get, but the um, kind of goes into play where you see Judah repent of you know his sins, but you don't see Joseph repent of his arrogance. Mm-hmm. And then you talk. Uh, we talked a little bit before about how uh, Manasseh and um, Ephraim Ephraim uh, become the half tribes that that mm-hmm. carry Joseph's title and lineage. There's not a jo- tribe of Joseph, right? And, and how. You know, you, if you're comparing the, the repentance versus the unrepentant, you're going to see that with, uh, with the, the way the blessings are played out. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about that, too. And probably not this episode. But yeah, all of this factors in. And I think that's the really cool thing when you actually sit down and look at this as a narrative and start picking those threads out. 
you can begin to see how they play off each other, Mm -hmm. where when you get one little bit each week, and I know we're doing this with a podcast, I'm not throwing stones, it's just the structure of what we've got. Well, and it's also the the mass of the material. Yeah, it, it really is. And then when you've got these, you know, like with, you've got Joseph being sold into slavery, and then you have Judah and Tamar, which seems so unrelated, yeah. and then you go back to Joseph, but still having to hold on to that thread through the Judah and well, Tamar yeah, story. Well, yeah, but I mean, what's the alternative? We just read the text. Right. And well, there's there's already places you can find that. Yeah. So, and, 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 and not to knock that, I mean, that, that's, mm-hmm. a, that's a fantastic resource. I, I do that at work quite a bit. I'll just listen through a couple books, the Bible here and there, because, and one of the things I found uh, when I do that is it's kind of cool because it, when you, when we're reading the text, we kind of anticipate where we are. We may not do it consciously, but we're like, okay, we're in this chapter around mm-hmm. this verse and we have these chapters and verses in our heads and we think, oh, well, this one means this and this one means that. And sometimes when you, whenever you have someone reading, uh, just reading the text, it just really can, can sneak up on you. And you're like, whoa, hey, that I hadn't thought of it that way. But when they said it in that tone, right. it, made it, it had a different meaning. Yeah. And what, what inflection did they use? They, yeah. you, and what emphasis did they put on which word? All of that plays in. Yeah. And I think that we forget sometimes that this was not a text that was meant to be read. This was something that was supposed to be, I mean, it is meant to be read. It was meant to be read aloud to a group, there you not go. silently. Exactly. And we don't do that. So, um, but moving on. So speaking of hearing, Pharaoh and his court, they hear that um, Joseph's brothers have arrived. Mm-hmm. And this text specifically, uh, this is verse 16, says that they're pleased. Because, I mean, if one Joseph was great for Egypt... We got 11 more. 11 more must be amazing. <laughs> and Pharaoh, I, he immediately starts, um, I, this is, he starts plotting and scheming. He says, tells Joseph, he goes, say to your brothers, do as, uh, do as follows. Load up your beast, go at once to the land of Canaan, take your father and your household and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. You will live off the fat of the land and you are bidden to... Do as follows. Take from the land of Egypt wagons for your children and wives. Bring your father and never mind your belongings for the best of all the land of Egypt shall be yours. Don't bring your stuff. Yeah. Bring your people. We don't want your stuff. Yeah. Which is funny because it's flipped over at the uh, during the Exodus. It, it, I hadn't thought about that, but that's really. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Get out of here. Just don't even worry about bringing anything. We got you taken care of. And then. Then it's like, oh, yeah, you really will take care of them later. <laughs> uh, you, yeah, you definitely are. Well, it, it, but by not bringing your stuff, what am I saying? I want you to be fully dependent on me. Yeah. And I want you to leave all the har- hallmarks of who you are, what your personal identity is. Leave that behind. Mm-hmm. We've already made Joseph into an Egyptian. We can do the same thing with you if you let us. <laughs> I, he's really, I mean, he's plotting here. And it sounds so gracious and it sounds so kind, but you got to go back. Pharaoh and Laban, going back to that Laban story, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm a good guy. You're a good guy. All's going to be great if you just stay with me. Right. It, it's that same mindset because Pharaoh and, and Laban are really have the same character. Sure. And this is the reason why when we talked about that episode where uh, uh, the tradition where Balaam and Laban were the same person. Mm-hmm. And Balaam being a product of Egypt, and this is why this can all tie in, because the, the ancient readers saw these trends. Yeah. And they, they really looked at these people as people, not just abstractions and guiding principles, but as real flesh and blood. Right, right. So, uh, I, and I've got to point this out, because I love this, when Joseph goes to his brothers and he, he tells them, uh, you know, he gives them uh, gifts. He gives them all a change of clothing, except for Benjamin. He gives him three because Joseph has picked up on that favoritism thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and he sends all the best things back of Egypt back to his father, which really kind of doesn't make sense to me. I'm going to send you all the stuff you need to move back. Um, but anyway, that's one of those weird things. And he tells his brothers. Well, and it may have, it may have been prov- just provision for the journey because it, at the same time, because they came down to get food. They, they didn't have anything. Right. So that might have been like part of it. it it could be well and it, that is definitely part of it because it says and provisions for his father on oh, the journey okay. well sorry so, yep yeah, yeah. <laughs> i haven't read through read this the in bible a, i haven't read through, through this in a few days <laughs> I've, I've slept since then yeah yeah and we've had crazy weeks uh but i love what he says in verse 24 and he sent his brothers off on the way and he told them do not be quarrelsome on the way 
I, he's still being bossy. <laughs> like, <laughs> here, I, I need to tell you adults to act like adults. Yeah. And they're already showing that they're willing to work together. Well, and he's sending Benjamin back, right? He's, yeah, he's sending Benjamin. So it's like, yeah, d- don't be quarrelsome. I'm still not sure you're not going to sell that one. <laughs> exactly. And, but, and the thing is, they've already shown that they work together. Because uh-huh. whenever they said, hey, whoever stole your cup, you can kill him. The rest of us will be your slaves. Right. We understand collective punishment, which if you want to know more about collective punishment, Marion Brand has. Yeah, she's some, got a really, yeah, she's got a really good episode on that. Yeah. And there is purpose behind it. And we, we'll probably talk about that at some point. But uh, that's really kind of the first episode we see of collective punishment uh, with the brothers being willing and understanding it's a good thing and that it is about life. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, they go back to Jacob and it says that he's revived this is uh verse 27 and uh the spirit of jacob was revived uh, revived that word revived is based on the stem for to live he was and so the idea is that he was brought back to life Mm -hmm. was dead and is now alive (laughs) yeah so we have this resurrection theme that kind of pops up it's not very established or focused on but it's, it's not overt yeah it's it's there yeah okay And this is interesting. Yeah. Well, and this is like that. We're starting to move into a time where Jacob, too, is not going to be identified strictly as Jacob. He's also uh, this. We're starting to see the the title Israel being used of him Mm -hmm. a lot in this section because every decision he makes from here on out is not going to be something that impacts his life so much as it is the status of this budding nation. Okay. And so as he's making these decisions that specifically impact the future of the nation, now that name is being applied to him. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so we're going into chapter 46 and Jacob has some misgivings. He's kind of scared of what's getting ready to happen. Uh, he doesn't want to go to Egypt. He, ha- he has no desire to go to Egypt whatsoever. Right. He wants to see Joseph, but um, he's scared. And so God shows up and this is the last time we're going to hear from God um, until Moses. Okay. And God calls him, says, Jacob, Jacob. And that's a formulaic address in the Bible. When God calls someone, it's always that two times, Abraham, Abraham, you know, Jacob, Jacob. Uh, it, it's always twice. Hmm. And that's the reason why in Acts, when Paul was knocked down on the Damascus road and the voice cried, Saul, Saul. Yeah. It, he knew who it was because he knew that's who. He would have known his Bible. He would have known his Bible. Yeah. Exactly. And so Jacob, of course, he says, Hanani, here I am. And um, God tells him, says, and you it's, know. And it's been a few episodes. The Hanani is the um, at attention. Like, I'm, yeah, I, whatever it is, I'm here. I'm agreeing before I even know what the conditions are. Yeah. I, I will. You're God. I'm at your service. So, yeah. So. Sorry, uh, just, it's been a while since we've covered that. So mm-hmm. I want to make sure if anyone jumped in here that. They yeah. Got it. No, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so God says to him, uh, I am God, the God of your father. So the God of Isaac. Mm-hmm. Um, this is important because they're getting ready to go to Egypt. Right. There's a bazillion and one gods. And maybe not that many, but close. There's a large number. A large number. And so he's specifically saying, I am this particular God. I'm not another one. And the, you need to trust me. And so he tells him, fear not to go down to Egypt. Well, I think we all know anytime God says fear not. That it might be a little scary. Yeah. Um, He says, I will make you into a great nation. I myself, again, bringing it back to, he's the God who's going to do this. I will, I will go to Egypt and I myself will also go back. And Joseph's, uh, will bring you back. Sorry. I myself will go down to Egypt. I myself will bring you back. Joseph's hands will close your eyes. He, We read this and we don't realize what a profound statement that I myself will go down with you and I myself will come back with you. He's not bound by geography. Right. And that's, yeah, that's actually uh, something that I've thought about quite a bit because, um, and you and I have talked about this, uh, where in in ancient cultures, if you, if you moved a deity away from his land, he became less powerful. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's a pretty common concept. I mean, there's a whole series on stars, right? Is it stars to an yes. American gods? Yes. It's based on that same idea, mm-hmm. um, how the, the gods weaken when they leave their land. And so, yeah, that's that's really important that, that Yahweh's saying, no, I'm still God in Egypt. 
They yeah. don't know it yet, but I am. <laughs> and he's going to show them that he's he's God, even in Egypt. And this is the reason why Genesis really is about setting up that, um, what's getting ready to happen in Exodus. Mm-hmm. And so we're laying the groundwork here. And I think it's so easy for us to miss because we don't think about God. Um, we don't think the divine council worldview with that verse in Deuteronomy 32 that God's divided the nations up according to the number of the sons of God, mm-hmm. and that this idea that those sons of gods would have been worshipped as gods in those different nations. Right. And so um, to have a God who transcends that takes a God who made that. And only the God who made the decree is greater than the decree. Right. And so this is a great little testimony of God's, um, God's power. Um, the statement, Joseph will close your eyes. I think, you know, we pretty much get that from all the movies that we've ever watched that, you know, when Jacob dies, Joseph is going to be the one to close his eyes. Sure. So this is a great promise here. Um, and so Jacob finds the courage to actually, um, go down and he sets out from Beersheba and, um, it says very pointedly in verse six that they took along their livestock and their wealth that they had massed in the land of Canaan. So they, they brought everything. Yeah. It didn't matter what Pharaoh says, they're going to do their own thing. Um, so from this point on in this chapter, we're going to go into a genealogy and okay. you know, y'all know how I love genealogies. Uh, Nathan's like, that's news <laughs> to me. Uh, <laughs> No, I'm just saying, you know, we know, we know. But uh, verse eight is interesting in that it says, these are the names of the Israelites. This is the first time we have that term. We, we've mm-hmm. not seen this terminology used before that. So um, we're starting to see that they are, this is a nation. This is not just a family unit anymore. We're, we're building into something new and it's going to be, Egypt is really going to provide the backdrop as they are going to be distinct from Egypt. Mm-hmm. And so if you don't have that, that if you don't have Egypt to contrast with, then who are they? Right. Because we know from all the other archaeological evidence that they're very similar to the other tribes in Canaan. Mm-hmm. So when you take them out of Canaan, now they're distinct. And as they develop over the next 400 years uh, into this nation, now they become something distinct even from Canaan. And I think you brought this up in one of the books that you'd read. Yeah, I, I think I've mentioned this before on the show, but I know, uh, it's, I think it's, oh, what's his name? Uh, Cahill in uh, The Gifts of the Jews. I probably, it's probably over here somewhere. <laughs> um, but he, was, he talked about how uh, it's, it's speculated that the fact that the, the, the brothers all went down to Egypt and took all their people with them and that they were enslaved there, that that did kind of force them and kind of galvanize their identity Mm -hmm. as opposed to if they would have just kind of hung out in Canaan. And we, and we see bits of this happen when they go back of, of intermarriage and, and, you know, different, absolutely different people who don't necessarily see being part of, of God's people as their priority. So they do intermarry with, with some of the locals. And so the, it's believed that this idea of, they were all together stuck in one place with a unique identity and a unique look that they were, that's what forged them into that people. Mm -hmm. And then they were brought out later. And so it's, I think that's kind of an interesting concept. Yeah. Well, and I, I, like you said, I think there's biblical reasons for that one, especially when we start going into the conquest and we see how quickly they just fall right back into the the habits. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and these are people who weren't there. They were not raised, but they, it's still there. They weren't raised in the Canaanite culture, but they do. They just, they pick it right back up. Yeah. And so. Well, I mean, you, you're going to, I mean, you're going to have some influence of the culture that's around you to some degree. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, we just can't avoid it. It just kind of depends on which lines are we crossing? Are we crossing moil, moral, moral, <laughs> moral that's lines, a different, thing. different thing altogether. That's earlier in the program. Um, but <laughs> The, are are we crossing moral lines or are we crossing uh, preferential lines? Right. Well, and I think that's the reason why the Torah has to be so comprehensive. Mm-hmm. Why you have to have those 613 laws. Because if you're starting from a basis of nothing, right? then how do you know what is a moral line? What, how do you know what is true religion and 
not just something that is culturally based. So I, I, it makes sense that, you know, I, I know Christians like to bash Pharisees all the time. Oh, they had these 613 laws. Well, God gave them the 613 laws. Right, right. And we need to remember what those laws embodied. They were not laws like we would think of of religious laws. These were just laws for day-to-day living. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, wash your hands. Don't leave dead bodies in the middle of the camp. Um, don't pee in the street. Don't pee in the street. Yeah. You know, things that are important. Yeah. Yeah. And so and, the, and there are some, some uh, sacred laws and some ceremonial laws that need to be followed. But really, those are reserved for the Levites mm-hmm. and not necessarily for uh, the common man. The, these are for the priesthood. Well, you talk to any pastor, and I've been hanging out with a pastor friend of mine, the rules for pastors are different than the normal church person. Sure. They need to know more. So anyway, okay, I'll, I'll quit going on that. But yeah. No, it's, that, that's fine. We can talk about that all day if we want to, but go ahead. Oh, yeah. So, but with this genealogy, um, one of the things I want to point out, because this is a place where the, the Bible critics do have a problem. Uh, there's some contradictions within it. There's some omissions in it. Uh, there's even, there's contradictions from this passage and then like in Chronicles and in Judges and some other, some other genealogies. Mm-hmm. Um, the Septuagint has different names in here. Sure. But this was never meant to be a complete list. It, genealogies just aren't meant to be complete. Right. They never were. They're symbolic. The, the names that are included are there to prove certain points. Uh, there are the numbers that are in there. I, there's some fascinating studies done on the genealogy of uh, Jesus in Matthew and how that's busted up and the numbers uh, that are significant within that genealogy, which we won't go into. Right. But uh, all genealogies are, are constructed on that same principle. And so the... The main thing is, is that at the end of the day, the number that was said to have gone down with them is 70, which it's the totality of the people. Sure. Just like with, um, excuse me, just like with Babel, the, 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 the nations, the table of nations, the 70 nations, that it was, this is all, everything. Right. So um, we, we've got to remember that even though we do have these contradictions, it's, it's not a big deal. Right. Nobody who read their Bible expected it to be 100% dead on. And, you know, there's 53 men listed at one point among, <laughs> and one daughter. Right. So the, the, the odds are, no, um, nobody has 53 sons and one daughter. Um, <laughs> you know, there might be a lot of guys, but probably uh, not that much. But, okay, so he, he gets the, his family down there and... Um, there's 70 people, but he, it's a little interesting thing. I didn't realize until I went through this time uh, again, verse 28, he, and this is chapter 46, verse 28 says he had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to point him, um, to point the way before him to Goshen. So Judah goes ahead. Okay. And since Judah's going to be the head of the messianic, family, the mm. one that produces the Messiah, I, that's significant that he would go ahead and go before and sure. make the way. Yeah. And I really, I did not, I don't think I've ever heard anyone actually point that out in a lesson. No, I, I've definitely not, not heard that before. <laughs> I mean, but again, you know, how, how much time do we spend in the Old Testament? Not I, enough. I mean, yeah, not, not nearly enough. What, this is what, month six for us on um, yeah we're we're about yeah we're about six months into just genesis and we're barely really doing uh, we're not going super deep into the text we're just talking about things that are of interest and we started with chapter 11 we didn't even start at the beginning uh, right. so yeah you and you can just you can stay here and, and mine so much out of it um and we, especially when you start going into the retellings and And especially the last few chapters, we have a lot of that retailing elements brought up again and again, because when Joseph hears that, um, that Jacob's in town, he, he hitches his chariot and he rushes out to his father and he falls on his neck and cries. Mm -hmm. So who fell on Jacob's neck and cried? Yeah. 
in we're Esau. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. We're right back to Esau. And this is important because now that the story's shifting, and because in all of the patriarchal families up to this point, you had Isaac and Ishmael. There could only be one covenantal child. Mm-hmm. You had Jacob and Esau, only one covenantal child. Right. Now Jacob has 12 sons, and he wants all of them involved. Right. And this trip to Egypt isn't just so that Jacob can see his long lost son. He, it, it's to restore Joseph to his place within the family. Right. He doesn't want to lose one of them. So the narrative's changing. It no longer has to be where Esau, he had to make peace. He had to get along with him, but they couldn't walk in unity. So now he's going to Joseph, and this is a subversion of that first story. And because Joseph, he isn't just going to make peace with Joseph. Joseph needs to be included. Now he's mm-hmm. going to include Joseph very creatively because, you know, Joseph has become very Egyptian. Mm-hmm. And so he, but he's going to get very creative. Jacob's a schemer and he knows how to do it. And I, I think he does it with God's full blessing. Don't get me wrong. Um, well, and then that kind of speaks to the idea of we just have this idea of further inclusion, more and more inclusion into God's family. Right. It's just growing. And yeah. And, and it's just that opening the door is a little wider each time. Every time. And, and this is going to, to continue. And even, even as we move into like the conquest of Canaan and whenever they're, they're in the land and they're being told, hey, don't marry outsiders, what's the first thing they do? They go to Jericho and Rahab gets taken into the tribe. Mm-hmm. So even though there's that prohibition against not including outsiders, Outsiders wasn't even, by that point, it progressed to the point that an outsider wasn't someone from a different family. It was someone with a different mindset. Sure. It was someone with a different view of God. So Rahab had that fear of God, Mm -hmm. and that's where all of this begins. So um, moving into chapter 47. No, I I, I do wonder, though, like with with Rahab, even though, I mean, we don't know where she came from. We knew knew where she was living. I mean, is it possible that she was an Edomite who had decided to live in Jericho, you know, or had been resettled there in some way because God says, don't, uh, don't kill the Edomites, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we don't know. That's just speculation. I'm just curious if there's any, uh, work on, uh, on her lineage or, or her background. I'm sure, I'm sure there's some speculation there, but it would be interesting to see if there was anything preserved because being a prostitute and yes, she was a prostitute. She was not a hotel keeper. Uh, so anyway, I've heard that so many times. I've never, I've oh, never yeah. heard anyone play it down like that. Oh, yeah. She just had a hotel. No. Uh, so. Uh, okay. <laughs> but uh, so for her to have a, a family lineage uh, that was recorded might be, it, there's two possibilities. Okay. This is like major rabbit trail uh, <laughs> because either she was a prostitute in the sense of a temple prostitute, mm-hmm. which is unlikely. Which is unlikely, yeah, because yeah, she did help the Well, she the helped spies. them, and then she had, like, a business, a place of business there at the wall. Sure. And, you know, this is like the, the brothel at the end of the Fisherman's Wharf kind of thing. You know, she she was not set up for worship, necessarily. She was there to get business. And well, would that... But, <laughs> wait, wasn't the... What, oh, wasn't... Didn't Tamar sit by the gates? She did. And, and then... um. She did. And then there's also, but, and she was dressed asked, as. asked if, and you know, when they asked about her, they asked if she was a temple, like a cultic prostitute. So right. I don't know if there might've been something with. Well, and the thing was with Tamar, she doesn't sound like she was in a city that, that she was actually at the gates of, of a sacred area, okay. the, the place of open eyes where this, you know, this was just a city. But the thing was, if she is a sacred or a prostitute, mm-hmm. if, if Rahab was a sacred prostitute, then she would have some kind of royal or, uh, you know, elevated family to, to maintain that lineage. Sure. If she was just, hey, I need to survive. Right. And I think her family is mentioned in Joshua. And so uh, I know some family is because she does bring them out with her. I can't remember if it's her parents or what have you. Right. Um. Then, you know, then her lineage probably wouldn't be recorded anywhere. Right. And and if it was, it, it would have likely been that she had had a husband of status and fell out of favor or something right. like that. Yeah. So and, <laughs> as we get stuck on Rahab on uh, in the story of Joseph. 
Sorry, but, I, that was just a question that I had, but uh, go ahead. But no, because now I'm wondering, because, you know, I'm, I'm like trying to figure out a way to save this and make this sound like this is an intelligent tie-in and not just us going, you know, off the rails. They know what we do here. I know, but I was thinking. I don't know why you're pretending. Uh, I know, because, you know, never mind. Uh, we'll just skip that. But no, what I was thinking was that if she was from one of these other tribes living in a foreign land with a kind of a, a status of, Evidently, she is somewhat respected within the city because it was prime real estate to have that location. Right. And um, then when the soldiers come in, she's like, nope, no one here. And they believed her. Exactly. Exactly. When well, they probably, you know, had lots of interaction with her. So there actually could be a parallel with Joseph being in Egypt, um, which would be interesting to explore. So uh, but I'm going to need to do more research. And y'all guys don't want to wait for me to do that on air. So anyway, <laughs> so we're, we're going into chapter 47. and. Um, Joseph came to Pharaoh and he, he reports to him and says, my brothers, my father and my brothers and their flocks and herds and all that is there have come from the land of Canaan and they are now in the land of Goshen. Now, Pharaoh didn't want them settling in Goshen. He wanted them settling in, Can- in the Egypt. Right. And so the fact that they're in Goshen is Joseph kind of pushing back against Pharaoh with what Pharaoh wanted. And, um, so Joseph's kind of, he may be overstepping his bounds a little bit. Mm. And you kind of got to wonder, is the segregation that, that Joseph is wanting to impose, is it to protect his brothers? Or is he ashamed of them? Yeah. Because, because he ta- isn't this where he talks about um, their, their shepherds? The shepherds. What, what they do is, a, is an abomination here. So, yes. you know, yeah, it, I, I can definitely see that, that side of it where he's, he doesn't want everyone knowing Hey, I come from a, a bunch of, of mm-hmm. shepherds, sheep raisers, whatever they are. Yeah. Shepherds. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Well, and um, he, Joseph actually coaches them in what to say to Pharaoh. And this is like one of the few scripted um, dialogues we have. And he, he said, tells his brother, hey, this is what Pharaoh's going to ask. And this is what you need to say. And basically, Pharaoh's going to ask what your occupation is because Pharaoh's always looking for what's the good of the country. Mm-hmm. So who, who can he put to work and how? And he says, um, tell them that we are your servants. We're shepherds, as was our fathers. And we have come to sojourn in your land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks and the famine being severe in the land of Canaan. Pray then, let your servants stay in the land of Goshen. And so the, the brothers do have this. Uh, and, you know, the, this was the idea of being a shepherd was abhorrent. There's a lot of different uh, theories as to why that was. Mm -hmm. The most popular is that Egyptians were vegetarians. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Well, Herodotus, um, one of the early um, historians, he said that Egyptians were vegetarians and they ate only fish and birds. Um, It's not really supported by the archaeological I was going to say that's kind of difficult to be to have a whole society of vegetarians in that <laughs> climate. Well, I mean, it, well, in that in that climate during that time, you don't have as, mm-hmm. as food preservation. You don't have the you're not you don't have the same processing you can get. I mean, I guess they could all eat beans, right? Um, but do we have any evidence that they grew beans? I but I, mean, I don't know. I I don't know what the record looks like uh, archaeologically. That's not that's not my my specialty. Um, but yeah, it just seems, it seems like that's, uh, I mean, unless it's just to talk about how wealthy they are, because you have to be a wealthy nation to be vegetarians. Right. Right. Otherwise you, you're, you know, you got to raise animals to to get a protein source for somewhere. Yeah. And so. Especially through the winter. Oh yeah. Well, of course, you know, they didn't have the real harsh winters like, like we do, but that's the whole, you know, how, how much of that plays in is a good question. And we just have a couple of references from outsiders, right? Uh, but, from the Greeks observing the Egyptians sure, that say but, this. Well, yeah, but you don't you don't have you don't have a harsh winter, but you do have a growing season and mm-hmm. a fallow season. Yeah, you know, it's not like, yeah, it, it, it's not um, it, it's not like where we have the you know just growing all year. They're, right. They, they they depended on that flooding cycle. Otherwise, exactly. they didn't have any food. Uh, yeah, of course. And, well, and, that, and that's and that's the thing. How how did they I mean, they do have some major trade routes, but then we're back to that. They've got to be rich. And yep. so it, it's and, still, and they, they may have been, I mean, or at least the aristocracy may have been. Yeah. 
Well, and who cares about the little, you know, underling? They they had they were expendable. Sure. So I, I the problem is with the with the Greek sources that say the Egyptians were vegetarians, we're looking five to a thousand years after this point, at least, if not more. So we it, it may not even apply. Even if it's true, it may not apply to this day. Right. The second theory is um, the Hyksos um, kings. They're known as the shepherd kings. Mm -hmm. We know that at some point that they invaded um, Egypt and that they established the 15th dynasty. And it's, they, they invaded sometime probably around 1782. Um, and the Egyptians really resented these invaders. They, they, saw them as less than they were not, you know, the true heirs to the Egyptian uh, throne and representatives of Horus as they should be. Mm -hmm. The problem is we've got some real conflict on their dates and from one to 500 years about how long they stayed there. So they could have come and gone by the time Joseph got there. Right. They could have still been in power by the time that Moses was born. Mm -hmm. And the, we do know that this group of people, not only were they known as the shepherd kings because they did work livestock, but they were also Canaanite in origin. Mm -hmm. They, um, the archaeological record seems to look, it seems to support the idea that they, they came in, they were smart, they helped organize different systems, they were able to um, preserve life in different ways in Egypt and were just brilliant people who accepted Egyptian customs and culture and really became a part of the fabric of Egypt. And, but they still had Semitic names. They had names very similar to the Hebrew people. And so this has led to the idea that maybe they were the Hebrews. Okay. But that's probably not accurate. Um, but you're going to find writings. If you go out on, you know, on the internet, you're going to find all these writings that try to support this. But the thing is, the dates really don't work for them to be the Hebrews, uh, even though they could overlap. Okay. So uh, most scholars reject this, but the only people you're going to find who really um, support it are your, as Heiser put it, your Christian Middle Earthers. So I, I yeah, it, you know, Scholars don't reject things because, wow, they're just too good. Right. Um, you know, they're, we want to find those bits and pieces and connections to help explain stuff. We love that. Um, but we try to operate with a kind of a level of integrity. Uh, Josephus includes the record of this time in Egypt, and he picks from an Egyptian uh, historian whose uh, name is Mantheos. And he really villainized them as being as rising up and like slaughtering the Egyptians, mm -hmm. and and so we get into that violence. And of course, we have no record of violence against the Egyptians from the Hebrew people. Right, now, God gets violent. Yeah, but the people themselves do not get violent. So if you're looking this up, you're going to come across this. Keep cruising. Spend your time searching someplace else. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you want to look at it, then I. I'm not going to try to stop anyone. Well, there's nothing wrong with being familiar with the argument. Right. Um, just, just be aware of what you're dealing with. Um, the third option is that the word abhorrent doesn't mean the same thing to the Hebrews as it does to the Egyptians. Okay. And which we know that happens in languages. Mm -hmm. And the idea that abhorrent could have meant taboo. Now, taboo doesn't mean bad. It means sacred. It means something you shouldn't mess with because it belongs to the gods. Right. And so the, they could have been abhorrent or taboo because they were dealing with cattle and cattle were the symbols of a lot of their very prominent gods. Right. And so the cattle were actually at one point pretty much belonged only, and we're getting ready to talk about how this came to be belonged only to Pharaoh and only to the priestly caste. And so the idea that, um, that this separation wasn't, it, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? It wasn't a put down. It, it was actually an elevation. Okay. And that because they were able to do this, that there was something, um, 
special about that. Okay. And we do know that Pharaoh had like large, large, uh, different Pharaohs have large herds of cattle. I mean, numbering right. up into five and 6,000. Um, the fourth option, and this is brought to you by the great theologians. You need to know their names. Rogers and Hammerstein. Okay. The farmer and the cowman should be friends. Sure. Um, I, and no, seriously, because the thing is, the Egyptians were basically farmers. Mm -hmm. This is what they did. Since the beginning of time, farmers and shepherds fight. Right. This is what they do. So we could have all these convoluted theories, but possibly it could have been that simple. That, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's reasonable. Now, the, the taboo argument is supported a little bit from Scripture because uh, in this passage, verse 6, we're still in chapter 47, the land of Egypt is open before you settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them stay in the region of Goshen. And if you know any capable men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. And so Pharaoh's saying, they need to be over my field. So probably not vegetarian. Right. I think that kind of takes it out. Um, they belong to Pharaoh. Um, we know that Ramses III basically employed only foreigners to watch after his livestock. And it was the idea that we couldn't let the Egyptian people have the knowledge of how to care for the livestock. Hmm. And that by keeping that kind of secret from the general populace, this gave him power because then we have other documents where these livestock are used to feed the priest and they're used to feed the armies. So he really mm -hmm. used it as a source of power. Um, so in offering this position, and, and the position is uh, Sare Mikna, which is officer of the cattle. Uh, this, is, this title's found in Egyptian inscriptions. It is a position of honor. Now they would, if they took this position, they're now officially in the employ of Pharaoh, which means that now they're officially protected by Pharaoh. Right. And so, again, that elev elevation kind of taboo ideology, I think that has some support. Um, and I, I think that makes a whole lot more sense than, oh, look at them. They're, they're vegetarians. And, you know, <laughs> that, that, this might be the reason that they would, uh, that they would be abhorrent. So, it, well, and that, that idea of, of keeping it separate, keeping the, the, the supply of meat away from the people, um, making <laughs> making Pharaoh be the one in charge. I mean, that's actually interesting because we'll get to this later on. Um, or no, I guess we kind of got to it already. It's like now, now we have the 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 food too. We have all the grains and everything later mm -hmm. on. So now everything's going to Pharaoh at this it, point. It, it's starting to funnel that way. And why would he need the brothers? Because he knows he's going to be getting more cattle. <laughs> I mean, this right. is. And this is also very Leo Su, uh, the Chinese philosopher, uh, in art of war. Sure. How how do you how do you control the population? Well, by controlling the food and making sure that you can keep them fed. Yeah. And they're dependent on you for that. So yeah, and because we're going to actually get into that, and on the next episode is the 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 systems that go into play that Joseph uses to feed the nation. Yeah. Um. But before we get there, one, one little thing as we wrap up this chat. Well, this is actually the beginning of the other chap of the next chapter, but I want to point this. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I don't know what chapter we're in. So, okay, we're 47, verse 7. Um, we got this little interlude here that Jacob actually goes to see Pharaoh, and they have this conversation where Pharaoh asks Jacob, he says, how many are the years of your life? And Jacob, he's so Rebecca's son. Um, he says, the years of my sojourn on earth are 130. Few and hard have been the years of my life, nor do they come up to the lifespan of my father uh, during their sojourns. So I I'm 130 years old. Life has been awful. Not much of me to see. <laughs> Not much of a home, not <laughs> much, much of a donkey. donkey. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's this weird little conversation here because um, after he says this, he, he 
tells Pharaoh goodbye and leaves Pharaoh's presence. Mm -hmm. And and this is, that's the end of this exchange. It's just about the lifespan uh, of Jacob. Now, the thing is in Egypt at this time, we do know that the ideal lifespan for an Egyptian was 110 years old. Okay. So one of the questions that he could possibly be asking or the information he's really trying to get at is how blessed are you really? Yeah. Well, and it's really funny that, that he's just like, I haven't done much with my life. <laughs> like <laughs> it's been bad, but it's like, when you look at it, it's like, dude, you, we've got all this story <laughs> before this. We know you did things. Um, but it's so Rebecca, it sounds just like his mom. These Hittite women are going to be the death of me. Why should I live? If I, you know, I, all of this, it, it, he is so Rebecca. And, and Rebecca was so Abraham. Yeah. And, and, you know, so you're starting to kind of get the sense that God kind of likes dramatic people, which I don't get. But I mean, no, it's. <laughs> hey, you know, th- there's a great variety in the world. There, there is. And but, I mean, the, like the, the, the drama and, uh, that goes into these lives and. You know, they did. You can't downplay the fact that they really did go through some crazy stuff. Right. And anything we live out today, I mean, I don't want to downplay anything that we go through. Our, our pain is our pain and our pain's all valid because it's our pain. But at the same time, they face things that most people today are not going to understand. Right. Right. And so um, for for Jacob to to say this, uh, you know, 130 years is few, and we're we're hoping that we make it to 80 and 90, you know, today. Right. Um, and they're hard. Yes, they have been hard years, but he still hasn't just relaxed and let himself accept that what he's been praying for and what he's been, you know, he kept it in his heart that Joseph was going to see his dreams come true. Right. And so he he hasn't allowed himself to rejoice over the fact that that what he had hoped for is happening. Mm -hmm. So I, I I just, that was another little part in this that I didn't, again, I don't think I've ever seen it taught on. And that's actually going to be very important for where we end up. Okay. So cool. Well, that's, that seems like a good place to end it this week. Um, And yeah, there's a whole lot of, (laughs) a whole lot in there. So um, everyone out there on the interwebs, the internet, wherever it is you're tuning in, podcast, YouTube. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll be back next week. In the meantime, uh, to be part of the conversation, hit us up, Raven Creek SC, on all social media, ravencreeksc.com. Um, for more information, you can also go to ravencreeksc.com slash faith and other oddities for some blogs and companion posts, some extra material. Um, if you really like what you heard, hit up Raven Creek SC, no, patreon.com slash Raven Creek SC or uh, Patreon. Or yeah, that's the one. Or you can uh, always hit the support link on the uh, the page and you can do a one time donation through uh, PayPal, PayPal as well. Um, just many ways to show your appreciation, which we hope you appreciate the show. If not, we still are having a whole <laughs> bunch of fun and we look forward to seeing you back here next week. Sounds good. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs> and other oddities podcast a raven creek social club production don't forget to follow us on facebook twitter and instagram if you like what you've heard please write us a review on itunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash raven creek sc as always thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week